much for this morning's service. We also want to take this opportunity to greet and salute those who are joining us online this morning for this morning's message and the ministry of the Word is concerned. We do pray that the Word of the Lord will do us all good this morning, both in this place and those who are following online as well. Amen to that. And this morning, um, what the Lord has laid on my heart, and I just want to give you the title and we'll get into the message in a little more detail, but it's about becoming heavenly minded. It's about becoming heavenly minded. And uh, we're going to look into what God has laid on our heart and what I believe God is saying to us in this time about becoming heavenly minded. And the very, very first thing that the Lord has laid on our heart is this in this time is that there is a call to holiness. There is a call to holiness. There is a call to true holiness. There is a call to holiness after the biblical order and the biblical standard of holiness. The Bible reads in 1 Peter 1 verse 15, it says, But as the one who called you is holy, the one who called us is holy. He is not becoming holy. He is holy. So the people that he calls are called to become like him. Hallelujah. So the one who called us is holy. And we see in this portion of scripture, listen, you are also called to be holy in all your conduct. So there's a call of God. There's a call unto salvation. But you know, over and above that, there is a call to holiness. We're not just called to salvation. I know it's not there. We're not just called to the church. We believe that's important, but the call does not end there. It goes further. And God says we are called to His holiness because whatever He is, He wants us to enjoy. Another portion of Scripture says we are called to partake of the holy nature of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. To partake of His nature. And His nature is holy. And so we are called to partake of it. And that word partake is a good word because as Christians, we understand that word to mean food. We invite our Christians over, we say, come, we've spread the table, come and partake of what's on the table. And you know what that means. You don't have to be good at English, you don't have to be good at any language to decode that. That means you're getting there and you feast. And when the Bible says partake of his nature, it means to take, it means to have an appetite for what he has and for who he is. And so there's a call to holiness in this hour. If we are going to become heavenly minded, we must become obsessed with holiness. And our standards of holiness must grow and increase. We cannot enjoy the standards of yesteryears. We must establish and find new levels of holiness even in this hour. But as the one who calls you is holy, be holy in all conduct, because it is written, be holy for I'm holy. And this is God's word and this is God's command to us. I know I shared a message with us some time ago about Lot, the nephew of Abraham, who after they parted ways went to live in a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible documents that Lot lived in this place. But after a while, Lot's heart was vexed. His heart was grieved with what was going on in the area and in life round about him. And the challenge to us today is this. Are we grieved like Lot was grieved? Because Lot lived in a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. And I think some of us have got a good idea of what Sodom and Gomorrah was all about. It was a place of perversity. It was a place of sexual immorality. It was a place of ungodliness where people were not godly in their faith, godly in their thinking. They were perverse in their thinking. And in, Gener in Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says just before the flood of Noah, it says that the thought of man had become wicked. It says that it repented God that he made man. And it says in Genesis chapter 6 that his every thought was towards evil. This was what happened. This is what prevailed. This was a kind of mindset that permeated Sodom and Gomorrah. I, I don't know if they had computers, but if they did, if they had an internet, it was filled with perversity. I don't know if they had newspapers that they circulated back in the day, but if they did have, if they did have some sort of publication and circulation, it was filled with sin, it was filled with immorality, it was filled with everything perverse and anti-God. 
That was the generation that Lord found himself in. And I, and I want to submit to you today, we are living in a time that is akin to Sodom and Gomorrah, if not worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, where the thought of man, his every thought is towards evil. We, we, we came through, we are going through this pandemic, but it never ceases to amaze me how many charlatans find a way to make an ungodly buck out of people, even in a time of deprivation, poverty, sickness, and misery, they can find a way to earn an ungodly buck. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing, man? Every thought is towards evil. Just look at the ingenuity of criminals that is going on right now. Look at the perversity that is going on. Look at what is being offered. Look at what is being dished up on what is called television today. Someone rightfully called it television instead of television. Look at what is being dished up. Man, every thought is towards evil. My question is, are you entertained by it or are you grieved by it? Lot was vexed with what was going on in his day and in his hour. I just want to say this morning, my strong sentiments and prayers go out to the young people found in this generation. I know that God has held us strong in every generation. And I know that God will hold you strong in this generation. But I take a moment to spare a thought for young people in this generation because you are facing stuff we didn't face back then. We are facing, you are facing stuff we didn't face back then. But our God is good. He's strong in every generation and He'll come through for you if you will submit to Him. If you will place your life in His hands. Because I tell you what, you, you are no force where this evil is concerned. You are no force. You are no competition if you're going to try and resist it in your own strength. You've got to do it in his strength. Amen. And there's so much perversity. I just put a little title down here in my notes. It's called The Absurdity of Holiness in this day and age. If you go to the average person and say, live a holy life and try to depict and characterize and outline what a holy life is, they'll say that's absurd. You cannot live that life in light of the current lifestyle that is prevalent today. You cannot, it's absurd to try and be holy. But yet God calls you to be holy. God calls you to be separate. And that's what holiness means. It means to be separate from other things and from what other people are doing. We were talking in the course of this week as we were commenting and focusing on Rosh Hashanah and saying this is most likely the feast in which the rapture will take place. And I heard someone say, I don't think I'm ready for this rapture, but I have news for you in case you felt that way. If God could save Lot and deliver Lot, don't worry, you have a better position than Lot was in. Lot didn't have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, didn't have a Bible, but he was separate. He had an innate sense. It was his conscience that ruled and guided his life concerning what was not right and wrong. But we have Christ and we have the Spirit of Christ. Amen. And if Lot could be saved, trust me, God has got you earmarked and reserved better things. Amen. So draw some comfort from that this morning. In Jesus' mighty name. But as I said, spare a thought for our young people and the singles that are going through life at this point in time because everything is perverse. Everything is desperately, desperately wicked in this world. Desperately wicked. And so there's a call to holiness. There's a call to holiness. And I love what the writer says in this portion of scripture. He says, be holy in all your conduct. Some Bibles say conversation. But the word conduct is the Hebrew word, Greek word, anostrophe. And it refers to your speech. It refers to your lifestyle. It, re it refers to everything that pertains to you, your conduct, your charity. It's everything about you. It's your entire conduct. And Peter writes, what manner of persons we ought to be living in this day and age. What manner of persons we ought to be. For God has not called us unto, clean, to, unto uncleanness, but God has called us unto holiness. The Bible says, touch not the unclean thing, and I will be to you a God, and you shall be to me a people. I like what is happening in terms of the World Health Regulations concerning COVID-19. I do not say I like COVID-19. I like the regulations and the guidelines that they put forth. And, 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 and what, what is very strong is the social distancing. And the other thing that is equally strong, don't touch anything. And if you do, cleanse your hands immediately. And 
I find an amazing application to us as Christians. If we can follow these things concerning spiritual things, we'll be in a good position. And if we can fight the sickness by following the guidelines of health, bring it over spiritually, and if we can follow the guidelines spiritually, we'll keep ourselves away from the peril of sin. Social distancing is good. Distancing yourself from certain things, certain people, certain tendencies, certain lifestyle. That's imperative where your Christian life is concerned. Touch not the unclean thing. And if you should inadvertently touch it, we have the washing of the waters of His Word to cleanse us. Immediately made available to us. Hallelujah. And so as I said earlier, it's the absurdity of saying to someone, live holy in this world. How can you? It's like me saying to you, if you go home today, jump in your car, but reverse it all the way home. I mean, you're going to look ridiculous reversing your car. You're on the right side of the road, okay. You're going to stop at the stop street, stop at the red light. You're going to, you know, you when it's time. You do all the right things, but you're reversing your car all the way back home. You're going to look crazy. But that's what we as Christians are doing. We are going in the opposite direction. When the entire world is going the other way. But this is what I'm preaching to you about. It's that grace that we need to be strong enough to say, well, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to do it the world's way, but I'm going to do it God's way. And when you're holy, you stand out. You don't have to do much. Just do what God wants you to do. And you look very different to the rest of the world. And that's what holiness is. And God's calling us to holiness. And I just want to throw some things out there before moving on to my next point. We can, we can sit here and debate holiness. What is holiness? Your standard, your version, com compared to mine. And you know what? We will not, we will not arrive at the, at, the, at the right level that God wants us to arrive at because your subjective view and my subjective view is different. I have a view of holiness, but it's very one-sided because I focus on what I think is wrong. And I've made some, some, some decisions in that area, but it doesn't encompass everything in every area of our lifestyle. So basically, instead of asking me what is right and what is holiness, ask God what's holy. He'll give you His answer. You see, because His answer is after His standards, and His standards are set in heaven, not here on earth. Let me help you further with this. If you are caught up with regards to what should I do, not do, what can I entertain, not entertain, what can I embrace or not embrace, just ask yourself this, are they doing it in heaven? And if they're not doing it in heaven, then don't do it here on earth. Because listen, there's a call to holiness. We must understand where we're going. If that's where you're going, then you need to get rid of this thing. Because this thing is going to keep you from getting to the other side. Because they don't do it on that side. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Are we understanding this this morning? Yes. So what was vexed with what was going on? And we're living in a day and age when what was once condemned is now celebrated. And vice versa. And we've got to ensure that we're not falling into that trap. of Celebrating what was once condemned. So it's a call to holiness. It's a call to remember the believer's election by the heavenly Father through sanctification of the Spirit. It's a call unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. It's a call to lay aside malice, all guile, all hypocrisy, evil, and evil speakings. And can I just throw forgiveness in there as well? This is no time to harbor unforgiveness. It doesn't matter who said what, who did what to you. This is not a time, it's not an economical time, it's not a spiritual time. It's not a time to entertain any sort of, un of, of unforgiveness. You know, the Lord was speaking to me about this, about this whole thing of forgiveness. You know when you cannot entertain forgiveness anymore, you stop running the race. You stop running the race. And we are all called to run the race with patience that is set before us. Do you know when you meet up with an accident, God forbid this happened, but you jump out and you evaluate your car, you know, and the, and the guilty person comes to you and says, sorry, my name is Jim. Here's my uh, insurance details. Let your insurance contact my insurance and they'll fix your car. You don't consider on the side of the road and say, no, I had it, that's it. You bad drivers, I can't take this anymore. Just leave my car there, I'm not going to drive anymore. Really? Will you not say, yo, I need your details, please. I want my car fixed because tomorrow I want to be back on the road. I need to continue driving. You don't say, well, we have this bad accident. Just take my car. I'm not going to drive anymore. That's ludicrous. You want to drive because you've got to live. There are things you need to do. 
When people say, can't forgive anymore, it means you've stopped running the race. If you're running the race, you know, I need to get over this in order to get there. Come on now. And that's part of holiness. It's a call to holiness. What could possibly keep you from forgiving someone knowing you're going to heaven? How big is an offense? Come on, let's get over it. Are we running the race? Can I challenge you if you're watching online? Are you still running this race? Are you still running this race? We live our lives according to God's standard, not the world's standard. Holiness is calling us to be distinct from the world and to put on the new man created after Christ Jesus in the true likeness of God, true righteousness, and true holiness. Hallelujah. Let's move on this morning. Second thing about being heavenly minded or developing a heavenly mindset, we need to hold fast to his promises. We need to hold fast to his promises. Second Peter 3 and 3 reads, knowing this first, that they shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers have fallen asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Sadly, Satan, who is called the adversary, will always oppose God's word. Let's narrow that down. Let's bring it down to a place of understanding. He will always challenge the promises of God's word. He'll never challenge Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. No. He'll say, no, that's a done deal. But where God promised, for example, Genesis 3 and 15, and God said, I will put... Uh, I will bring a seed into the earth and the seed will bruise the serpent and maybe he'll get it and say, no, have God say. Mm. He always comes to dispute the promises of God. Mm. Now, Christians, what we need to do, we need to categorize the promises of God. And I don't know if you've come through this time richer than we, before you went into it, but in terms of the knowledge of God and the promises of God, we need to put the healing promises of God in one box. We need to put the provisions, God's promise of provision in another box. We need to put another uh, category where the, where the promises of his return are concerned. And we need to focus on those promises. And if we can add to it, do so. But focus on the promises of his return and become obsessed with it. We must focus. The Bible tells us that if we, are, if we are to become heavenly minded, we must hold fast to his promises. Now, I know it's good to hold, hold fast to the promise of healing. We need healing. The promise of provision. We need provision in this time. But hold fast to the promise of his return as well. Because if we don't hold fast to the promise of his return, there will be no witnessing in this day and age. There will be no serious intercession for the lost. If we do not hold fast to the promise of his return, we'll begin to give in to reckless living. We'll make reckless decisions. And we'll say, well, the Lord's delaying his coming. Let me just get into this and, and get into that. And I've always wanted to try this out and try that out. And when you, when you get into stuff that God hasn't allowed you to get into, you get into a trap and it takes time to come out of that and become available to God again. And in this time, I know that many have freed up their lives. They've freed up their commitments and they've said, I've made myself available to God. And we need to be available to Him in that regard. But hold on to the promise that he is returning, knowing that he who promised is faithful. Glory to God. Know where you're going. Heaven is your destination. So how do you recognize that promise? It's when God says, I will. And we know right now that there are people that are challenging the promises of God. Can I just get into a little bit of doctrinal stuff down here, a little bit of a theological stuff, and just come away from the encouragement that's coming and then we'll get back to the encouragement. The reason why Paul wrote letters was because people wrote letters to him. We know that. Many times the, the letters were written in response to questions. And the reason why he wrote 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is because teachers, erroneous teachers, were teaching false things concerning the return of Christ. They were teaching false teachings concerning those who were dead, saying there's no resurrection for the dead and that there's no coming back of the Lord. And even in some instances, some were told that the rapture had taken place and everyone who was left is now a fini, meaning rejected. And people in the early church began to lose heart and lose faith. 
And so this news reached Paul, and Paul wrote back to them to say, I'm still here. You know, so back in the day, they did not have the modern technology we have. We've got phones. We can just find out, you know, has the rapture taken place? Cape Town. My friend at Cape Town, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here at Table Mountain. Yeah. <laughs> That's our thing. Back in the day, Paul was miles away. They didn't know whether he was raptured or not. And someone was teaching Paul stuff. So Paul wrote to rectify the erroneous teaching. And we've got to teach concerning end times in its context and in the correct perspective. Because people are losing heart. Because people are saying other things concerning the promises of God. And we need to be doctrinally correct where these messages are concerned. Hallelujah. Concerning end time. And hold on to the promises. 2 Peter 3.14 says, So then, dear brothers, since we are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. Read that to you again. Since we are looking forward to this, meaning we are holding on to this promise. We are not letting go of this promise. And we need to be fully persuaded where the promises of God are concerned. Regardless of where we find ourselves, fully persuaded of the seasons and the times. Remember, we don't know the day or the hour, but we can see the seasons. And how many of you can tell something's happening right now? I just got word, I don't know if you did as well, that there was a slight tremor in Cape Town. Cape Town? Tremor? Yeah, this Cape Town. Not Cape Canaveral. There's another Cape Town. I thought there's another Cape Town in Australia. But uh, yeah, this Cape Town. You can do the right. End times. Amen. We need to be holding on to these promises like never before. Thirdly, what's this? If we, are, if we are going to become heavenly minded, we need to connect with his divine purpose like never before. We need to connect with his divine purpose like never before. Luke 12, 43 says, it will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Again, we don't know the day or the hour, but how do you want Christ to find you? Where do you want him to find you? What would you be found doing? What would you rather be found doing? Now, I know we can't always be on our knees. We can't always be in church. We've got jobs to take care of. We've got lives to live, children to look after, things to do. But what would you rather him find you doing when he returns? Pray that that will be your case. Now, I know we need to go to work. Tomorrow we need to go to work. And if he should return, then wonderful. Let him find you at your desk ready for him. If he should come at a time when you are enjoying your personal time with him, then let him find you on your knees. Amen. For that matter. And if you are asleep for that matter, you have just committed your soul into his hands to keep during the course of the evening. Amen. But listen, regardless, we need to be connected with his purpose like never before. To be connected, or should I say reconnect, we need to entertain now in this hour the higher purposes of God for the church and where the ministry is concerned. We need to be obsessed with salvation and the salvation of souls because we realize now more than ever what the church is here for is to see people get saved. We need to confess them saved. We need to pray them saved. We need to intercede for people who are not saved. We need to intercede for people who are hard-hearted because the Bible says he who is often warned and reproved, who hardens his heart shall be destroyed, and that without remedy, meaning there won't be a second chance. But whilst there is still grace, let us pray, let us minister, let us be obsessed with this thing where souls are concerned. Because if you ask God right now, what is on his heart? And he'll tell you, it's souls, unsaved souls. Like the Bible says, there's much rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that is saved. And God takes pride, it's just one, one, one. It matters where one life is concerned. One that will say yes to, to God, hallelujah, whose name will be written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Remember between Rosh Hashanah and Atonement, there's a period of repentance. It's known as the Ten High Holy Days. Come tomorrow, we have what is called Nila. Nila means the gates close, hallelujah. And what has been inscribed in these ten days will now be legislated legislated going forward. We do not want that. This is the period of grace. Let's say yes, where there are open heavens. Let's say yes, let's pray, let's pray them in, in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Let's be connected with these purposes like never before. Within the first few months of lockdown, and it's alright if you confess this, I'm willing to forgive you. 
Just about all of us prayed for rapture, yeah. didn't we? I, I mean, you know, when you've got a headache, what do you want? The multivitamin is not going to help you. You know, it might try to help you run faster, feel a bit energetic. But when you've got an headache, a headache, you need one thing. I need a pill. I need an antidote. I need a, a pill. You know, a, a painkiller. That's all. And when you're in a time like we've been in the first three months, you look for the, the fix that is most commensurate to what you're going through. And it was rapture. It was, oh Lord, let it be. Let it be. And then as we got closer to Rosh Hashanah last week, we realized how much more there is still to be done. And we said, oh Lord, if you can spare us, give us grace, give us another 12 months. Let us come back. Let us come out of this and be more effective for you. But here's the thing. In the first three months, we said rapture. It, we, we were not bothered with what's going on in the world. I mean, we just saw the carnage. We saw the, the devastation. We saw the increase in the number of virus uh, uh, recordings and we, you know, holy fear got a hold of us. We just said, rapture, get us out of here, you know. But now we realize, so many months later, we can see things in perspective. What we wanted was not the best. How many of you know that? But God knows better and God can see better from where he is. And so, having said that, we're living in a time right now, today, where our perspectives have been changed now. We are realizing God's giving us a holy perspective, and it's not just to desire to be taken out of here, but to be more effective to God in the kingdom of God right now, to be connected with his purposes like never before, amen. But at the same time, still looking forward to his return, as Second Peter 3 and 12 says, looking forward to the day of God and to speed its coming. Listen, we are grateful to be given an opportunity to be here and to be relevant, albeit for a short period of time. We are grateful. We don't know how much longer we've got. The Bible says, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Now, you couldn't really you know, drop some deep theological stuff on you this morning. You don't have time to explain it. But I don't know if you believe like me in the millennial day. Do you know what is the millennial day? Parents, you should know when a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And a thousand as a day with the Lord. So God created creation in six days. And on the seventh day he rested. That whole picture in Genesis is a calendar of the, the earth's lifespan. The earth's lifespan will last for six thousand years. And the seven thousand years is the seventh day of rest. Are we good with that? So let me drop this on you. From Adam to Christ, 4,000 years. From Christ to his millennium reign is another 3,000 years. That will take us to the year 30, 30 AD. Because Christ died 30 years later. 30, 30 AD. If you take the 1,000 year millennium away from 30, 30 AD, you left with 20, 30 AD. 20, 30 is nine years away from today. Okay, let's go deeper. Do you believe in the rapture? Do you believe in the tribulation? That seven years shaved off from 2030 brings you to 2023. So suddenly you begin to think, we don't have a lot of time, eh? If you believe in the seven year millennial day of God, a day with the Lord is a thousand. Count. Right through the 7,000 years, take off Christ's millennial reign for a thousand years, brings you to the year 2030. Take off the tribulation period seven years, leaves you at 2023. Just some mathematics so you can go home and deliberate on that. Here's the message. Redeeming the time. We do not have a lot of time. So whether he comes today, tomorrow, 2023, we do not have a lot of time. Here's our message. We want a greater message to go out. We want greater ministry. We want greater miracles. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And for years we have debated that, we have theorized it, we have prayed it, we have interpreted it, we have personal interpretation, corporate interpretation. What does it mean to you? To a musician, it means let me sing louder. To a music group, it says let's sing better music, and that's all okay. To an intercessor, it means I need to pray with more fervency and more guts and more uh, commitment. It means different things to different people. But I like this interpretation. 
A minister was once talking to the Lord in prayer. And we won't mention his name. He's very popular and televised right around the world at this point in time. And uh, he was still a very insignificant minister. And people were talking about their ministries. And he was looking up at greater ministers and great ministers back in the day. And he said, Lord, what can, what can you give me? What message would you give me that will lift you up higher? Because he was obsessed with lifting up Jesus higher. And the Lord gave him the message of grace. And when he began to teach and preach grace, the church began to grow. And his fame went around the world. And he preaches grace like no other preacher preaches grace. And so here's the point. We need to ask God, what message will you give us? Can you give us to preach at this point in time? will lift up Jesus higher. Mm -hmm. Not something that will lift us up and put our names in the limelight, but what can you give us that will lift up Jesus higher? That's what it means to be connected with these divine purposes like never before. Hallelujah. To be given more grace to serve Him in this day and in this hour. And number four, we need to hold fast to our confession. If we are going to become heavenly minded, we need to hold fast to our profession. Hebrews 10, 23 says, hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. Hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And it says without wavering. We're living in a time where people are beginning to waver in their faith, where people are beginning to doubt. And that's why I said earlier, we must hold on to the promises of God. We cannot doubt in this time. There's a saying, don't doubt in the dark what God showed you in the light. And this is the time when people are beginning to doubt. They're doubting healing. Many people have lost people. They have lost their loved ones. There's a lot of stuff going on. But we cannot lose our faith at this point in time. We cannot lose the profession of our faith. We've got to hold on to it. It's a call to beware lest you fall from your steadfastness. Beware lest you fall from your steadfastness. Your confession of faith. It's not simply letting others know what you believe, but it's a demonstration of your faith. And the Bible warns us again. It says, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And Paul, speaking of this day and age, said, this day of the Lord shall not come unless they come first, a falling away from the faith. And the falling away of the faith is not only people backsliding. It's not only people going back to their former ways. That's not the only thing he's referring to. It's about depart, departing from the biblical principles of our faith. Departing from it. Going away from the things. No longer believing like we once believed. And Paul goes on to, to say, I'm afraid. That, <laughs> listen to him. He says, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. The devil is very powerful at deception. He's got many tools in his arsenal that he uses. Many tools. And this morning I want to focus on this one called deception. He is a master at deception. Listen closely. He deceived a third of the angels. Holy angels. With lots of brains, way smarter than some of us. He deceived them. He came to Eve, who was still in a state of purity and innocence, and deceived her. You are no match for the devil. No, wait, let me, let me finish that. You are no match for the devil. A renewed mind is not enough where he is concerned. We need the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth is our only safeguard against the deception of the enemy. I know, I, I look back over the year and there's so many decisions and things that I've done. And I look back and I say, did I really do that? Did I really say that? Did I really do that? And then you realize deception is very real. He still comes to Christians. He still comes to the best of us. Thank God there were not horrendous decisions. Thank God there were not things that would... Uh, uh, end, up, end up with you being in jail or, or, or going to court or, or something like that. But nevertheless, there, there were little moments of deception. And I know it's deception because you think it's right. Mm -hmm. And then you realize oh, it's the wrong way. Mm -hmm. It's like you're traveling and you're lost and you just choose Peter, this avenue, that avenue. And you take this road and it's a dead end. <laughs> you know, like that. Then you realize, you know, I'm really taking chances. 
And sometimes it happens to us in life. He deceives us. He makes you think something is good, but it's not good. He makes you make a decision and you realize it's not the best decision. That's why the Bible says we need the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. Our minds renew that you might know the perfect will of God. Perfect will of God. Deception is very strong. And listen to this. When Christ comes, his second coming, he ushers in what is called the millennium period of Christ. Because when he returns, he ends the tribulation period. He commences the millennium kingdom of Christ here on earth. The false prophet and the antichrist are thrown into the lake of fire. Satan is bound by one angel and cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. At the end of a thousand years, one angel goes down again and releases Satan. He comes up and the Bible says he deceives the world. After being under Christ's rule for a thousand years, he deceives people again. And then there's the final battle. In the battle of Armageddon, Christ destroys the nations of the world with the rod of his mouth. In this final battle, God's arm comes out of heaven and he gives the devil a club for the first time in a long time. The father's been holding his anger against this guy. He defeats him personally. Check the Bible. It says fire came out of heaven and zapped him. Then he's taken and thrown into the lake of fire where he deserves to be. But when Jesus comes, Jesus destroys them with the rod of his mouth, Armageddon. But when Satan is released at the end of a thousand years, God himself deals with him. He says, I've had enough of you, boy. I've been waiting for this moment. Fire from heaven. Sorts him out. But he deceives the nations. Hold fast to your confidence that has a promise of great reward. Do not lose heart right here at the end. 2 Peter 5, 3 verse 17 says, Therefore, dear brothers, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawlessness and fall from your secure position. Yeah. Fifthly, we need to be diligent about our progress. If we are to become heavenly minded, we must become diligent about our progress. Peter writes so well in his uh, second episode 3 verse 18, he says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Have you marked your growth? Have you surpassed the standards and the limitations of 2019? The Bible says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look forward to such things, be diligent that you may be found in Him. And it's the word diligent that I want you to hang on to and take with you as God of this place today. To be diligent about your progress. To be diligent means to monitor it. Monitor your success. If you run on a treadmill, you look at your time. You key in your time 20 minutes. And at the end of it, depending on what speed and how you've set your treadmill, it will tell you how many kilometers you've traversed. It will tell you how many calories or calories you've killed in that one session. If you are diligent about why you are doing what you're doing, you monitor all of that so that you can say, tomorrow I'm going to push this thing up a little more or next week I'm going to push it up a little more. I'm going to do a little more. That's being diligent about what you're doing. Are we diligent about our Christianity? Are we diligent about our progress? It's progress that I'm talking about. But if you're not diligent, you won't make any progress. You can't measure it. Are you measuring your progress? Are we growing in Christ? Listen, Paul wrote to some of his converts and he said this in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. He says so. And he goes on to say, and such were some of you. He says, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Do you have that testimony, child of God? Or are you still possessing those character traits? Do you have your before and after pictures of your Christianity? This is who I used to be. This is who I am now. This is who I used to be. This is who I am now. Do you have your before and after pictures for that matter? 
Paul says, such for some of you. Do we have that testimony today whereby we can stand up and say, I used to be that person. I used to do that. But this is who I am now in Christ. Come on. We're talking about being diligent about your progress. Listen to what he says to young Timothy. He says, make full proof of your ministry. Second Timothy 4 and 5. He says, but watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. In these closing moments today, fulfill your ministry. The last six months was all about survival. Come on, let's face it. You had your mask on. You had your spray all around you. You had your hand sanitizers. Your doors were closed. You were very careful about work and where you went and what you did and who you socialized with. It was all about survival. We focused on surviving. We focused on looking after our families and our children. Listen, more often than not, there are setbacks in our progress. Either things done to you or things done by you that adversely affects your progress. But this is a time to spring back. And I know the last six months has been about survival, but it's time to spring back. We gotta get out of survival mode and become more connected with the purposes of God. I know in survival mode, we abandon some good practices. We abandon some commitments. We abandon some good practices. But that was necessary under survival mode. But it's time to come out. It's time to emerge. It's a new season. Can you hear God speaking prophetically to his church saying, it's a new season. Let's get back to winning ways. Let's get back to the things we used to do. And in some instances, it's going to be new things that God wants you to do. Amen. Get out of survival mode. Now, it doesn't mean to say you must become reckless in your walk. Reckless with, with, with your health is concerned. You've got to maintain all of that still. But get out of that survival mode and get more pro proactive in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. We are emerging into a new season. And I know we have moments as Christians where we lapse in our commitment. We lapse in our prayer life. We lapse in our worship. We lapse in everything. We have those moments. And then we spring back. And Paul recognized that in the Philippian church. And he said to them in Philippians 4 and 10. He says, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Listen, now at last your care will be as flourished again. In other words, there was a time when they were committed to God and the things of God and the kingdom of God, but they had a momentary lapse of commitment, of doing good, of serving. They left, but Paul recognized that they were peaking again, and he could see their renewed, revived interest in the things of God, the kingdom of God, and he commended them publicly, saying, at last, your care of me has flourished again. And you notice he uses the word long lost, at last. It's normally at the end. And can God say that to us, this church, be my at last, in the right time, your interest has peaked. Your interest has revived. Come on, there's a spiritual revival. Come on, people are getting back to God, getting back to winning ways, more connected with the purposes of God than ever before. And whatever setback, was it the sickness, the disease, the financial thing? aspect of things or whatever you've managed to get beyond that and we're getting back to winning ways hallelujah so paul said to young timothy make full proof of your ministry and it doesn't matter whether you're called to fivefold or the other side of the fivefold do what do what you've been called to do to the fullest and to the best of your ability come on now now is that time to do that we don't know the day or the hour but we know that he's coming soon are you ready to meet with him? Are you ready to meet with him? If we have this trusting and abiding sense of faith in our relationship with God, then listen to what the, the revelator John writes in 1 John 2.28. It says, We have this relationship with him so that we may be confident and unashamed at his coming. Because we know we are doing our level best what he has called us to do. We've committed ourselves to him. I was listening to another speaker speak about this year now when Rosh Hashanah is the head of the new year. We in the year 5781. 5781, that's in the Hebrew calendar. And the Hebrew language is such an interesting language because um, it has symbols and it has numbers. 
And when you calculate the symbols and the numbers, it speaks about the ox. And Jesus said, he who puts his hands to the plowshare must not look back. And in closing, I'm going to leave that thought with you. This is the time to extend your hands to the plowshare, the ox, and not look back. Maybe over the last six months you've had moments of momentary, momentary lapses. You've been set back in your faith, set back in your walk. But it's a time to come back with renewed commitment, renewed interest, to grab a hold of the plowshare and not look back. Amen. And that's what the, it was symbolized in the year 5781 as well. In this time of the new year, that being Rosh Hashanah. Amen. So that we may be confident and unashamed at his return. And if so, we may echo with the saints. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. That's about being heavenly minded. Developing a heavenly mindset. Amen. Praise God. Amen.